Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. If you've got a copy of God's Word, why don't you go ahead and get it open with me right now, Isaiah chapter 53. Well, I was up at Shamanal with some of the guys at men's conference yesterday. They suggested to me that since there were going to be less men in the service today, that this would be the perfect time to start with an illustration about flowers and Gilmore girls, but I will spare you. So let's talk about high school. It was the summer before my senior year of high school, and I had uh, gone on a mission trip the summer before my senior year of high school. I spent six weeks on a short-term mission trip. So when I came back, just had a couple weeks before school started, and I had a list of all the things I wanted to do in those few weeks between when I got back from serving the Lord and when school was going to start. So uh, my summer itinerary was pretty much go to Denny's and drink a lot of cherry Coke and play wiffle ball home run derby with my two best friends. And um, it was kind of weird. Um, I, I had a group of three of us in high school that were best friends. It was Craig, Greg, and Dale. So I didn't fit in from very early in life. But um, and, and w- w- with, the, with this jam-packed schedule of drinking Coke and playing wiffle ball, I surely didn't have time for homework. Unfortunately, one of my high school teachers thought it would be a really cool idea to assign summer homework. I'd signed up for advanced placement English literature, and the teacher of that class sent us home with a stack of books about this high and said, y'all need to read all of these before school starts. I put down the wiffle ball bat, and I dove into a pile of books. I can't remember all of them, but you know there is a specific book I read that summer that I remembered by a man named Tim O'Brien. It was relatively new. It was released in the 1990s. It told the stories of Vietnam soldiers. The book was called The Things They Carried. And it began with a story about the soldiers carrying pictures with them into war, but it became quickly apparent that the things these men carried, what they brought home with them were much deeper than physical things. They carried with them in the depths of their soul the horrors of war and the reminders of the things that they'd seen. And the book unfolded with stories about what it was like to carry such a heavy burden. And I think that the reason that that book was so well received, it won several awards, it was uh, considered deeply impactful, I think the reason that happened is because we can relate. So many of us carry things in our lives. And this morning at church, You might have walked in this morning carrying some stuff. I don't know what you're carrying this morning. Maybe you're carrying the weight of a heavy week. Maybe you're carrying the week or the weight of the things that have happened to you early in life, things that have become heavy, things that have become an awful burden, things that seem to tear apart your very soul, some things that have happened to you that perhaps you haven't talked about in years, but it seems like everywhere you go, you carry those things. Isaiah's been building for weeks to make one incredible declaration this morning. For months, we've been studying from Isaiah 40 to uh, stopping in chapter 55 in just a couple weeks. But here we are in this pivotal section, Isaiah chapter 53, where he wants to make and declare an incredible truth. The things you carry can be carried away. Maybe we can say it this way. It's our main point this morning. The things you carry can become the things that Jesus carried. That's what Isaiah is describing in the second half of the poem that we call Isaiah chapter 53. If you were here last week, you remember that Isaiah chapter 53 is a poem. It was written in five stanzas. Each stanza is three verses. And so what we have are verses, stanzas one and five kind of going together, stanzas two and four going together, and then this third stanza kind of stands out in the middle without a partner to pair with it, and that's because Isaiah has designed it to stand out as the most important of the five stanzas. And so what is being declared in this central highlighted portion of the text, and what's it about? It's about the things that Jesus carried And so this morning, three thoughts on what Jesus carried. We're going to answer the question, what did Jesus carry? And then we're going to answer the question, why did Jesus carry these things? So two points on what Jesus carried, and then one point on why Jesus carried these things. And so let's jump in, and we'll start in verse 4. It says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you were here last week, we began talking about Isaiah chapter 53 by saying that it was describing a group of people who were mourning about a servant that they had missed. And the question was, why did they miss what the servant had accomplished? And the servant had done this great work. They'd failed to see it. Verse 4 kind of continues in that same line of thinking. The second part of verse 4 explains why people missed what the servant had done. The people had expectation that the servant would do work and ministry according to what they expected from the servant, this victory in earthly power and prestige. That's not what happened. The servant came suffering and verse four said, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. The servant didn't act the part of the Messiah that they were expecting because the servant suffered. Now, now the people in that time had an expectation of how suffering worked, and it was this cause and effect mentality. And the idea was, if you suffer, it's because you've sinned. The cause is sin, the effect is suffering. We say things like that in the church, don't we? Choose to sin, choose to suffer. If you sow, you will reap what you've sown. You get what you have caused. And so the people looked at the effect of the servant suffering and they said the only thing that it could have caused God to allow that level of suffering in his servant's life is that God had rejected him. He'd done away with him because of some sin that he had committed. We considered him, it said, smitten by God. But here's the thing. Isaiah's kind of reversing their expectations. Just because it's normally true that if you sin, you will at some point reap suffering and judgment, the inverse isn't always the case. If you suffer, it's not always because you've sinned. There are other reasons that suffering comes into life. And so the servant suffered And Isaiah said, you thought he suffered because God was done with him, but he actually suffered for a completely different reason. And so the question almost jumps off the page at that point. And the question is, well, then why did he suffer? Well, the text tells us, and there's a really interesting link between verses three and four that explain why he suffered. If you look at verse three, it says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It describes his suffering as being acquainted with grief. He knew what it was like to have horrible things happen in life. But then verse four links on that word grief and it gives it a totally new dimension. And it said, surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our our sorrows. The things Jesus carried were not his own. The horrible, terrible, awful things that Jesus carried were ours. Here's the crucial term in verse five. Upon him. Upon him. It's a callback to earlier in the Old Testament, it's a callback to Leviticus chapter 16. And Leviticus chapter 16 was all about the day of atonement. Atonement was the idea of how could sinful people have a relationship with a pure, holy, sinless God. And the answer was, the only way that sinful people could be in relationship with a sinless God is for at one meant atonement to be made. And so how could atonement be made? How could sin be done away with? And Leviticus chapter 16 describes a ceremony that pictures atonement happening. And the ceremony describes that they would select these two goats. And the first goat would be killed as a sacrifice for sin. But the second goat is the goat that we want to focus on. And the second goat, well, let's just look back to Leviticus chapter 16 and see what it describes. In Leviticus 16 Verse 21 and 22, it says, The high priest Aaron shall lay both his hands 
on the head of the live goat. Pause right there. Upon him, on the head of, there's your link, the high priest shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel, all their transgressions, all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who has been prepared. And the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. So here's the deal. Last week we saw that the people had to get purified to be in the presence of God. And that happened because sin was like a sickness that infected us and we were sprinkled to be made clean by the blood of Jesus. So the people were purified by the sprinkling in the first part of Isaiah's poem. But now the question is, is it only the people that need to be purified for God to be present and live with sinful people? And the answer is no, something else has to happen. Because God is so holy that not only do people have to be made pure to live in his presence, but the place where God dwells has to be made pure as well. And the way for the place to be made pure is for the sin to be removed. And the question is, how does the sin get removed? And the day of atonement gives us a picture. The sin gets symbolically transferred to the scapegoat and the scapegoat gets sent away. So the high priest would find this goat and he would say over the goat, I'm putting all the people's sins on you. See, what would happen is the place where the people lived would get corrupted day after day after day throughout each year as the people sinned more and sinned more and sinned more. And the sins built up, so the impurity built up, so God couldn't be present and hang out in the place where sin was. And so once a year, they would bring in this goat and they would say, all the sin that's been built up, we're putting it on the goat. And then they'd tell the goat to go away and they'd drive the goat away from the camp where the people lived. And the goat would run into the wilderness. That's why the goat in Leviticus 16 was named Azazel, wilderness. And the, the goat would be driven away into exile. And the picture was the goat is taking the people's sins far away. In fact, Jewish tradition tells us that someone would follow the goat out of camp and eventually they'd push the goat over a cliff so that the goat could never wander back into camp. The sin could never return. It was done away with forever. There needs to be a scapegoat to take away the sin so that the place can be pure. Now, let me say this about sin. So often when we think about sin corrupting the place where we are, we think about our sin, the things we have done wrong that causes guilt to be incurred. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the second half of our sermon. But what I want you to know is that it's not just the sins we commit that make the place we live stained with sin. It's all sin in general. And we experience sin in multiple ways. We experience sin by committing it, and we experience sin by having it committed to us. And sometimes the effects of sin that we carry are the sins that have been done to us. And we carry the pain of rejection and betrayal. Sometimes we carry the shame of thinking that I should have somehow been able to prevent this horrible, evil thing from happening. And maybe someone did something horrifically awful to me and I spend the rest of my life thinking I should have stopped it. I should have been stronger. It's on me that I allowed this thing to happen and I carry that shame and the shame and the pain stinks up the place with sin where we live. And then the scapegoat comes along and the scapegoat says all those things that you've carried, you can put it on the head of the scapegoat and the scapegoat's going to carry it away. And maybe this morning you've walked into church carrying some stuff. Maybe it's stuff you've carried for a long time. Stuff you don't like to talk about. Memories you've hidden far away. And you just need to know that the scapegoat savior would say, put that stuff on my head. And I'm going to take it outside the camp and it's never coming back.
See, here's the beautiful picture about how Jesus fulfilled the role of the scapegoat. The, the reason Jesus was led outside the city of Jerusalem to a hill called Calvary was because Jesus couldn't die in the place, the city where people lived. He had to be driven into exile because just like the scapegoat was sent into exile with the sin, Jesus was sent into exile with the sin so that it could be done away with finally, fully, and forever. And so when Jesus hung on the tree, he was hanging there as the scapegoat who said, all the sins that have been placed on me, I'm doing away with forever. You don't have to wear that identity anymore. You don't have to carry that label anymore. You don't have to be known with that reputation anymore because it's gone away on the head of the scapegoat and it has died on the cross with Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing that God is creating something new. The new creation God is making is a place where sin has no part. And to purify the place, God did away with sin by carrying it out on the head of the scapegoat suffering Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, the servant's role in this is an awful role. The one who knew no sin carried the oppressive weight of sin. The one who lived righteously and justly suffered the worst of injustices an interesting contrast in verses six and seven. There's a shared nature that we have with Jesus Christ, and yet it's very different. It says, like Jesus, we are sheep. But then it's contrasted, and it's like, we are sheep like Jesus, but we're sheep in the worst way, and Jesus is a sheep in the best way. So let's talk about that. In verse six, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. So, so here's the thing about sheep. If you leave sheep alone and you say, you know what, graze and find food in your pasture and just be sheep. You know what the sheep are gonna do? They're gonna wander off because that's what sheep do. Sheep are known as some of the dumbest animals in all of creation. And so sheep are left to, to, to wander around and they're just like, ooh, stream, Stream here, cliff here, that's okay. Meep, meep, boink. And, 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 and we're, we're like sheep in that sense because we look our whole lives for things that will satisfy our souls, for things that offer us hope and fun and potential fulfillment and potentially we're hurting and we see something that maybe can heal this deep wound in my soul. And we're like, ooh, bright lights, we'll go there. Ooh, party over here. Ooh, there's some friends I should hang out with. And we're just like, boink, ba boink, ba boink, wandering like sheep. And the scripture tells us that the Lord had to lay on the servant the iniquity that added up the way we stained the place where we lived because of our wandering like sheep. But Jesus was also compared to a sheep in verse seven, this suffering servant, it says in verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So we were compared to the worst part of sheep. Jesus was compared to the best part of sheep and the best thing sheep do is when they have the wool shorn off them, they're calm and they're quiet. They just accept that type of suffering. Now, some of you own dogs. And some of you who own dogs try to cut your dog's toenails. And how does that work out for you when you hold your dog down and say, it's time? No, no, Jesus was not like that. Jesus was calm and allowed it to happen to him. I think the picture here is that the wool had to be removed so that when the animal was killed, the meat of the animal was more easily accessible so you could have lamb chops and hero sandwiches uh, made a little more quickly. But sheep are just chill. You want to cut all my wool off? That's fine. The animal opens, not its mouth, Scripture says. And as Jesus went to his suffering. He didn't open his mouth either. He was the ultimate victim of injustice. Listen to what the text continues in verse eight. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. 
As for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Jesus suffered the worst of injustice. When they sent Jesus to the cross, they had a trial to determine whether or not he was guilty, and it was the ultimate sham trial. They brought in witnesses to lie about him. Though he was completely guiltless, they slandered him, and that false testimony is what condemned him. Maybe you've suffered injustice in a deep, horrific way. Jesus can identify with your injustice because he suffered injustice himself. Jesus was unlike other victims, however, because he willingly chose to suffer. He went to the cross knowing the cost. He willingly became our scape, uh, scapegoat. I love this line from Shane and Shane that describes well what happened. It says this, it was an unfair deal on the part of Christ. He got my sin. I got eternal life. It was injustice that took him to the cross. Perhaps the worst injustice was described in verse eight. According to the bystanders in this passage, what happened that was so horrific? He, he died, and that was, that was bad. He died for the sins of other people. That's terrible injustice. But what was even worse is that he died for the sins of other people without having children. Did you see it there in verse eight? As for his generation, those who would come after him, who would carry on his legacy, who would bear his name, and that culture, the worst thing that could happen to a person was to die without a descendant to carry on their name and to carry on their legacy. And so they looked at the servant dying and they said, he died young and he died without an heir. He died without someone to carry on his legacy and who would bear his name. And that is the most grievous of injustices even his death continued this theme of injustice happening to him. They made his grave with the wicked. His death occurred, propped up on a pole between two condemned criminals. And then it said his grave was made with a rich man in his death. And though that prophecy was fulfilled in an interesting way in Jesus' life, I think in Isaiah, it's saying that being, married, uh, being buried with a rich dude is not a great thing. Because in that culture, Kings were rich, you know, but if you weren't a king, the only way you could be rich is to deceive, swindle, cheat, and oppress other people. And so to be buried near a rich guy, it's not like, man, I got buried in Hollywood Hills next to all these incredible, powerful people and movie stars, and look at my gravestone near all these important people. No, 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 that's not what was happening here. It was saying, he got buried with the rich people, all the people that everybody hated, these people that everybody knew were cheating at life and hurting and destroying other people, man, he had to go be buried with the worst of the worst, the scummiest of the scummy. Everything about the injustice added up to what he was suffering. So the question becomes, why did the servant Jesus have to suffer all this injustice? And the answer is, Jesus willingly took all this injustice on himself because it was as if he was summoning all the injustice of history and saying, put it on me. All the injustice that has been suffered from the garden until the consummation, you put that injustice on me so that I can take it into exile on the cross and I can get rid of it. You put the injustice on me so that the injustice can die forever. Jesus carried our sin to the cross, but that's not the only thing Jesus carried. He also carried our guilt. Notice how verse 10 continues. It says, when you make his soul an offering for guilt. Now, some of you are like, my, my translation doesn't quite say it that way, pastor. Well, some translations tried to smooth it over because this is the only time in Isaiah 53 that a second person, a you, is used. And so it kind of seems like it disrupts the flow. So why does it go from this happened to him, he did this, he did that, to you do this? Well, the answer is that Isaiah is trying to make a point to his audience about what they, you, need to do. His soul is made 
a guilt offering, or better said, you make his soul a guilt offering. So here's what Isaiah 53 was doing. It said that the people needed to be sprinkled so they could be pure to get in the presence of God. That fulfilled Leviticus 14. The people needed a scapegoat to take the effects of sin away so that we could live in a pure place with God. That's Leviticus 16. But all the strands of Leviticus are being drawn together in Jesus and fulfilled in him. And so there's another strand that needs to be fulfilled. And that strand is the guilt offering. Because when people choose to sin, there's a price that has to get paid. So this is back in Leviticus chapter 6. And it says, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery or if he has oppressed his neighbor or if he has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely, in any of all the things that people do and sin thereby, if he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall have a fifth to it and give it to the one whom it belongs on the day he realizes it's guilt. Okay, so, uh, so what it's saying is there are sins you commit that you didn't realize you committed. And there are sins you committed that you just are like, you know what, I'm gonna do this because I wanna do this. I just feel like doing this sin. And, and the scripture says, if you sin like that, like you find somebody's $20 bill on the ground and they see you and they're like, hey, did you find my $20 bill? And you're like, nope, as you slide it into your pocket. Or you do something incredibly hurtful, the words you speak about someone behind their back and you realize, the scripture says, if you do those things, you're guilty. And you have to make restitution to the person you hurt, but there's also a price to be paid, not just to the person you hurt, but to God. Listen to this verse, verse six. He shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord and he shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and thereby become guilty. So, so here's the idea. When you sin, you need to make it right with the person you sinned against, but you also need to make it right with God. There's a price that comes about when a sin is committed. There's a make it right price. And so the make it right price was a pure unblemished animal that would be brought as a guilt offering. And so the people for generations would bring this animal and say, I chose to sin. Here's an animal. It's the price I'm paying to cover my guilt. And then Isaiah said this, you can make him a guilt offering. In Leviticus 5, verse 17, it says, if any soul, the Hebrew word there is nefesh. It means the, uh, the, the totality of what makes you human. It's translated soul or life. If, if any soul or life, if any nefesh needs to make a guilt offering, bring the animal. And Isaiah picks up on that and he plays with it. And he says, you can make the servant's nefesh your guilt offering. The soul who needs to make a guilt offering can make Jesus their guilt offering. And the question is, if I've sinned, if I've done something so awful that I'm not sure how I could ever make it right, how could God ever want anything to do with me after I made this choice, after I've gone to these places, after I've done these things, how can it ever be made right? What can I possibly do to cover up what I've done? What can I do? And, and, and the answer is, you bring an offering, and the question is, what offering do I bring? And the answer is, the offering that has been provided for you, you bring Jesus. And you say, he's my guilt offering. And what he did on the cross is the covering for my guilt. I don't have to bring a, lamb, a ram because I have the blood of the lamb of God. He's my guilt offering. So Jesus carried our sin. He carried our guilt. And the question becomes, why did he carry these things? Let's look at the final couple verses of Isaiah chapter 53. When you make his soul an offering for guilt, what will happen? Here's what Isaiah said. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, 
because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The biggest injustice that was suffered by the servant was that he had no offspring. But do you see what the text said? When you make his soul an offering for guilt, something incredible happens. He shall see his offspring. Now this is incredible. He had no offspring because he went to the cross so young, but he has offspring. Satan thought that he had killed Jesus on the cross, that everything Jesus was trying to accomplish went into the grave when his body was put into the ground. But Jesus won the ultimate victory because just a few hours after he went into the tomb, something started stirring and the triune God from heaven began speaking a word that would reverse what was happening. And through the power of the triune God, the body of Jesus Jesus Christ was reanimated with life and the sacrifice that he made was shown not to be at the cost of his life but at the cost of his temporary death so that victory could come into the grave so that the stone could be moved away so that the soul that had suffered and carried the pain and the shame and the guilt of sin could walk out of the tomb with Jesus Christ. Here's what Isaiah is saying. Jesus became the representative of the people of God. Just as the animal was the representative that carried the sin away, Jesus became the representative who took the sin to the cross. But just as Jesus represented us in his death, he also represents us in his life. We walk with him to the cross and we walk with him out of the tomb. He takes our sin and gives us back his resurrection life so that we can be made holy, fit, prepared to live in the new creation that God is making. And so I think it's so interesting. He shall see his offspring. Who are the offspring that Jesus sees? It's not physical offspring. It's those who become his offspring by faith. Jesus carried the things that he carried so that we could become his offspring by faith. And so I love it. In, in Acts, it says that the early church began being referred to as Christians, a word that means Christ ones. And why are we called Christ ones? Because we carry his name and will fulfill his legacy. The offspring that it looked like was lost on the cross was won through the resurrection, and we become his offspring when he becomes our savior. And so here's the question. Here's the question. When it says he shall make many righteous. What it's saying is there are many people across the world who will become part of the offspring, part of the family of God. The question is this, are you part of the family of God? So you can come to church and hear a lot about Jesus. You can know about what he did on the cross, but it's one thing to know about it, and it's another thing to be part of his family. And the question is, are you part of the family of God? Has there been a time when you have said, Jesus, not only do I know about what you've done on the cross, but I want to give you my shame and my pain and my guilt, and I want you to be my scapegoat, and I want you to be my guilt offering, and I want you to be the one who sprinkles me with your blood. Jesus, I want you to do all of those things for me because I am a ruined sinner, and I have no other hope of living in the presence of God, but that you would do the work for me. And you say to Jesus, become the one who takes away my sin. And I give you my life to live for you. If you've done those things, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Has there been a time in your life when that has happened for you? You can do it even this morning. One last thing I want to point out from the text. I find it very interesting what Jesus did. I said that he was taking all the strands of the old covenant from Leviticus and he was fulfilling them in his self. But one last one that you might not have known about in verse five, it says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. I think peace is a really interesting word here in this context because 
There were many offerings in Leviticus that Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled the sin offering. He fulfilled the guilt offering. He was the sprinkling for the unclean, sin-sick sinners. But there was also what was known in Leviticus chapter 3 as the peace offering. And the peace offering was unique among all the offerings that the people of God would make because the peace offering was the only offering that would be made voluntarily. The peace offering was the only offering that wasn't as a result of people sinning and needing to cover their sin. The peace offering was an offering you made because you were so grateful to be in a good relationship with God. And so the people would select an animal and they would bring the animal and it would be um, killed on the altar and the animal would, would be roasted like any other sacrifice. But what was unique about the peace offering, it was the only sacrifice that after it was put on the altar, the priest would take the animal back off the altar and they would take the meat from the sacrifice and the people who made the sacrifice would eat the meat of the offering. It was as though they were picturing that I am at peace with God and I'm celebrating a beautiful fellowship meal with God. And then you look back to Isaiah chapter 53 where it says, his chastisement brought us peace, but it says this in verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And I think what it's saying is this, Just as in Leviticus chapter 3, they would divide the meat portion by portion by portion to the Jewish people. And they would have this fellowship meal with God. The result of Jesus making us his family is that we can have peace with God. We can know that we're in a good place with God and that all his promises to us will come true. And that this new creation he's making, where all the sad and horrible things of this world will come untrue, and all the hopes of fresh recreation, life lived anew in the presence of God, in purity and holiness as God originally intended it to be, we know that we can look forward to that peace with God because Jesus became the peace for us. Has Jesus become your peace? Has he become your guilt offering? your sin-taking scapegoat, the one who sprinkled you with his blood. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've given yourself for us. We thank you that you've taken away all the effects of sin. You've taken away our guilt for when we've wandered away. You've taken away our pain and our shame for when sin has hurt us and wounded us so deeply, you know what it's like to suffer. And you've taken it all away so that we can be at peace with you and live in a place where sin will never be again. Fit us to live with you in that new creation that you're beginning in us even now through your Holy Spirit who's recreating us. We love you. We worship you. Amen.